everyone, and welcome to episode 144 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Well, this week I've been a little bit busy trying to get things ready for my book launch, which is going to be February 25th at 1 o'clock Eastern time. I'm going to be talking with Helen Castor about my new book, How to Live Like a Monk. And that's really exciting for me because, as you know, Helen Castor is one of the best historians we have out there, especially in medieval studies. So this is going to be an exciting time for me. But of course, I have to get things ready for that. So this week is going to be just me giving you a small podcast. And it's going to be hopefully something that is fun for you as it's fun for me. When you're researching a new book, you usually come across stuff that's pretty interesting and exciting, and not all of it makes it into the book. So today, in celebration of my late launch, which is going to be February 25th, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about some of my favorite things I learned while I was researching monks. So you can find out all about my interesting factoids right after this. So I thought I would start with something that maybe is useful for us here at the end of February, because I don't know about you, but February has been dragging on for me, (laughs) January and February. Perhaps it's because I live here in Ontario where it's been snowy, snowy, snowy and cold as it is every winter. And it's sometimes hard to keep your mental health up. And one of the things that I discovered when I was researching this book, the first chapter I worked on was the actual first chapter of the book in terms of bringing together monastic stuff and science. So I was talking about gardens and learning about gardens and plants and how these things work together. And I knew a little bit about how monks worked with plants for medicinal purposes and how they had the cloister garth there in the middle of their cloister so that they could refresh their eyes after they'd been doing a lot of scribing or copying books in the scriptorium. But one of the things that was exciting about creating this book was learning about the actual science that we have discovered in the time since the Middle Ages. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting that I learned was that plants are so good for our mental health. So we know that monks knew this. That's why they had such a beautiful green lawn in the middle of all their cloisters. But what was cool was learning some of the science behind this, how you can be put into a better mood if you have plants around you. And this is not just talking to plants, but you can actually be put into a better mood if you have pictures of plants around you. So if you need to pick me up here in the end of February, You can put a picture of a plant on your screensaver or in your house or in your cubicle if you're going to work these days, and that will automatically lift your mood just a little bit. And I mean, every little bit helps right now, right? One of the other things I learned about when I was learning about plants and monks that I didn't know before, and maybe I should have because I had looked at the plan of St. Gall before, and the plan of St. Gall is the ideal monastery as laid out in the Middle Ages. It was never built, but the plan is all there so you can look at what the ideal monastery is supposed to look like. And one of the things I hadn't realized before was that sometimes monks would bury their dead in orchards. So this is not just something that's on the plan of St. Gall. Sometimes they would actually bury their dead in orchards. And I thought this was very interesting because we think about graveyards these days as being kind of places where people don't hang out and where you have big stones. And it's just not a place that is used for anything else except for the burial of the dead. And for monks, this is a bit different. So it's kind of maybe a little bit disturbing when you think about past monks feeding the trees that are creating the food that people are eating right now. But this idea of having a green burial is something that I think is interesting in terms of monastic behavior. And one of the things that I thought was really cool that happened since I finished the book was that with the passing of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the idea of aquamation came out as being something that people were starting to think about. And I'm not sure people really talked about aquamation before this. So aquamation is kind of like cremation in that you are reducing the body into a smaller package, perhaps. Cremation, of course, you're turning into ash. And with aquamation, you are becoming part of the water. You're being dissolved by water, which is then balanced out again so that it's not acidic anymore or alkaline, I should say. And then the water is kind of flushed away. And so this was really interesting to me to find out that Archbishop Tutu had taken this route because it feels very much to me like hearkening back to these monastic ideas of being buried in a way that is environmentally friendly. So not every monk was buried underneath the floor as some 
very important people were back in the Middle Ages. Some of them were actually buried in the orchard. So this is something that you do see in the book. But at the time, Archbishop Tutu was still around, and it's sad to me that he's passed away now. But it was interesting that aquamation is one of the things that I do mention, at least in the end notes in the book, and that's something that has come to the fore since then. That's interesting, I think, when we think about ways in which we are connected to the Middle Ages and this spiritual idea that the body can return to the earth in a way that's not, that's not disturbing it, perhaps. A question that a friend of mine asked me the other day that I thought was really, really interesting and perhaps shows how closely she's read the book is one of the things I mentioned in the book is that during every mealtime, the monks would have someone reading to them from the works of the spiritual fathers, the church fathers, or some other book that's supposed to teach them something great. It could be the rule of St. Benedict. It could be something from Gospels, perhaps, or St. Augustine. And my friend asked me, when does the reader get to eat? <laughs> this is, uh, it's great that you cared about the reader. <laughs> well, St. Benedict actually takes care of this in the rule of St. Benedict. He says that you can have a snack before you do the reading, or if you're serving the brothers, you can have a snack before you serve, and then you can eat afterwards. So don't worry, St. Benedict has taken care of the readers and the servers. They don't have to starve if they are serving their brothers. If you listen to the podcast very often, you'll realize that one of the things I'm kind of obsessed about is medieval laundry. So this is a factoid that I had picked up before I started writing the book. That's something I definitely wanted to have in there. And that is the fact that we know that monks had to have more than one robe. St. Benedict mentions this in his rule because you have to be wearing one while the other one's getting clean. There is laundry going on in the Middle Ages. And so one of the things I found really fascinating was reading Julie Carr's book, called Life in the Medieval Cloister, which I really recommend to everybody. It has everything in it that you could ever want to know about monks and their normal life. And one of the things she has in it is that sometimes in some convents or some abbeys, people would have their names stitched inside their robes so that there wasn't confusion <laughs> when they were picking up their robes after they'd been laundered. And that sometimes people did fight about robes and which ones were clean and which ones were theirs. And I think that's really interesting. So thinking about monks and their everyday lives, you do find little little nuggets like this, the fact that they had to write their names inside their own robes, because even though they did have communal stuff, there's some stuff that you want to be yours, especially if it's clothing, I think, because you want the size to be right for one thing. And I don't know, I think it feels nice to have your own clothes. And perhaps this is the reason why they wanted to make sure that monks had their own clothes and stitched their names inside. We do know that monks also had things like a certain allotment of soap that they would have given to them on a regular basis. Laundry soap as well. They might be washing their own clothes. Nuns sometimes wash their clothes, which could be really scandalous if they were doing it in a place where people could see them washing their clothes. You might have a laundress doing it for the monastic community. Some people were pretty strict about that because they didn't think that women should be touching holy garments. So sometimes you had men doing this. One of the things that's in Carol Rockcliffe's article, A Marginal Occupation, which is about laundry, it's one of my favorite articles ever, it mentions that you can have a laundress at this one monastery, but she should be over 50. <laughs> So I don't know if this is because they think that this woman is going to be maybe less attractive to the monks. She should be past childbearing age at 50, I think, and that could be the, the other reason. But laundry is something that's going on in the monastery. And sometimes there are things that are going on that show a little bit of conflict between monks. Another thing that I think it's in Julie Carr's book that's talked about is that monks sometimes, they had to have their tonsures redone every once in a while. So they had to have that top part of their head shaved every once in a while. And it could be a little bit contentious, your place in the line, because by the time you got to the end of the shaving, the razors aren't going to be as sharp and the towels aren't going to be as dry and the water's not going to be as warm. So sometimes monks would kind of squabble over their place in line when they were getting their tonsures reshaped too. Uh, this is something that didn't make it into the book, but it's something I think is funny and really human. It really gets at the fact that these are just ordinary people who are living the life 
of monks. And it's a difficult life. And maybe sometimes your breaking point is the fact that by the time you get your tonsure done, the water is too cold. And speaking of the type of gossipy stuff that happens in a monastery, one of the best sources for this is the Chronicle of Bury St. Edmunds by Jocelyn of Breakland. And Peter Ganeshi and I did an actual podcast on this, so you can hear that as well, or you can read it for yourself. It's available in lots of different translations. But Jocelyn tells you all sorts of gossipy stuff. Much of it didn't make it into the book because... It's very specifically relevant to that particular monastery. And he's complaining about things that maybe wouldn't make your life better. And the purpose of my book was to help you make your life better. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of Jocelyn's stuff didn't make it in there. But he explains that these monks are gossiping about who is meant to be at the top of the order and who's getting elected and are they really good at this position. (laughs) So it really gives you a behind the scenes look at that kind of political manipulation that's happening at the monastery as well. But one of the things that did make it into the book, briefly, is the fact that there is a fire at Bury St. Edmunds at one point, and it wrecks the shrine to St. Edmund, and it wrecks the actual reliquary in which St. Edmund's relics are kept. And they get this shrine fixed up on the sly. (laughs) Jocelyn says that they get it fixed up basically under cover of night because they don't want the public to know that there has been this fire and that it's damaged to reliquary. I guess it would be damaging to the monastery's reputation, and perhaps it might shake people's faith a little bit that you would have a fire that would damage something as holy as the relics of St. Edmund. But I think it's really funny and interesting that Jocelyn tells us we got this fixed up on the sly because we didn't want people to realize that this reliquary had been damaged. So (laughs) that's something that makes it into the book as well. And I think it goes to show that you do have these human beings that are trying to try to live a life that's holy, but sometimes they do make mistakes or they want to cover up their mistakes. And again, it shows you the human element here, which is something that I really wanted to bring out in my book. And hopefully that comes through. I was actually watching Sister Act with my kids not too long ago. And there's the scene where Whoopi Goldberg is sneaking into the kitchen and the nuns are having ice cream after hours and they're not supposed to do this. And one of my kids said, do you think that there are people that are breaking the rules in convents? And having done this research and having read Jocelyn of Break Loans, I could tell her 100% that people in monasteries are breaking rules every once in a while. And that's fine. One of the things I'm going to get at in a second is that there is a certain amount of tolerance for that, which maybe we don't expect. One of the ways in which people broke rules is by sneaking pets into the monastery. This is something I think is not a cardinal rule in that I don't think people got in trouble for it all that much in that it was very widespread and that pets were working animals. So not just there for comfort or to be spoiled, but also working animals. And there is the story of the white cat and the monk, which is an actual medieval Irish poem that's become a kid's book that explains that sometimes you do have monks and animals working together. But a very funny example that I came across in my research was at least one nun had a monkey as a pet in a monastery, which is pretty funny, I think. You do see that Chaucer's Prioress, I think it is, has little white dogs too. So we know that people had broken the rules by having pets there too, although the mouser in the white cat and the monk is probably there for practical purposes, not just emotional purposes. But there is some rule breaking going on. One of the surprises for me, too, when I was researching monks, and I took on this project in order to learn more about monks because I didn't know all that much about them to begin with. So this was something that was a whole learning process for me to begin with, learning about science, learning about monks themselves. But one of the things that I learned was that monks had somebody who was in charge of the library always. And St. Benedict was really strict on the fact that everybody should be reading. He said, reading is really important 
Everybody should be reading. You should spend most of your Sunday reading. It's very, very important. And actually, he mentions that if you interrupt people's reading, that there are going to be punishments. And the punishments should be so severe as to make everybody else afraid. So reading is super important. So you do have a librarian who is handing out the books according to who needs what moral instruction or spiritual instruction. So these are given to people. They can't just randomly browse books and take them out. They're usually assigned to people based on what they need to learn or know. And the books in a monastic library are not just the Bible. <laughs> There's all sorts of information that they can learn there, everything from natural science to the works of the Holy Fathers. So lots of variety. There's stuff about medicine. There's stuff about astronomy, astrology, all of these things. And you can get into that more deeply in Seb Falk's book, The Light Ages. So definitely recommend that book too. But on the practical side and the funny stuff that I like to collect, there was the information that the librarian actually took down people's names when he handed the books out. And this might seem like a no-brainer now that I say it out loud, but it's interesting that they didn't just hand the books out. So I say this because these are monks, right? They're supposed to be spiritual athletes and, you know, above reproach. So you'd think you wouldn't need to actually write down the names of these monks because they would be returning their books. But we know that even monks are human fallible. So they had to write down the names of the monks who were taking out these books and what they took out. And I just thought that was really interesting. The idea of having a library card that gets signed out, you know, a register of who's taking out books is really interesting, probably because I'm of an age where we actually had those library cards where you had to sign them, right? It wasn't all digital. I'm really dating myself. But the idea that people are registering the books that they're taking out, I thought was really, really interesting. You can learn more about the roles of each of the people in the monastery by reading one of the sources I used, which was the observances of the Priory of Barnwell which is an Augustinian one. Now, Augustinians are friars, not monks, so it's slightly different, but it really gives you a sense of all the people who are in the monastery and what their jobs are. And the person who was in charge of the books was in charge of not only handing them out and recording who had them, but also in charge of repairing the books and correcting the reader. So this person really had to be familiar with what was in the books as well as who was borrowing them. On a related note, one of the books that I looked at that really told me a lot about spiritual life was the Ankrin Rule or the Ankrin Awissa. I use a translation of it because as with all sorts of books, you want to pull out quotes that speak to people. And that's something that I wanted to do for this book as well. But Anchorites are the people, if you haven't listened to my podcast on Anchorites or you haven't learned about them before, they're people who are isolated in one cell. So they spend their time in one cell, not in a community, but they are part of the community in that people will come and talk to them and ask them for spiritual advice. So they're not so isolated, but the idea is that they are meant to be kind of like urban hermits where they are practicing their spirituality all by themselves for the most part. So this is a very strict religious life. It's not for everybody. It's very hard, as we know <laughs> from several years of isolation now, that being by yourself and living in your head a lot can be really difficult. So this is the most difficult, challenging way of leading a spiritual life in the Middle Ages. And so reading the Ankrin Rule or the Ankrin Oisa was really interesting to me because it had little nuggets in there that show a bit of flexibility that maybe... I hadn't expected. So we know that these people are meant to be praying all the time, as much as possible, or just thinking about spiritual matters all the time. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting was many of the times the people who are anchorites were women or anchoresses. And so the Ankrin rule was written for them, for women specifically. This particular source is written for women. And some of the advice in it suggests that you should be reading a lot. So not only are these women, these particular women, and they we think that they were written for specific women who this bishop actually knew, they are illiterate enough that they should be reading every day. And the part I think is really interesting is that sometimes the advice is that you should be reading more than you should be praying. 
because in some ways, reading is more enjoyable. And the experience of reading and having that joy and pleasure from reading can sometimes be more valuable than actually praying. And this is something that, I don't know, I wasn't expecting. I was expecting that an anchoress or an anchorite or a monk would be expected to be constantly speaking to God in praise or asking for intercession on behalf of other people. I didn't expect them to be advised to read sometimes more than pray. And so I thought that was really interesting. The anchor rule, again, it's so it's for individuals, again, not communities, but there's a lot of related ideas in it talks about how you should be following a rule, these rules, but you should be following it in a way that is flexible, slightly flexible. Also in the rule of St. Benedict, he mentions that you should follow these rules as much as possible, but there is going to be some flexibility. And every religious source that I came across that was talking about the life that you're living as a monk or as an anchorite, the life that you're living that's very difficult and spiritual, recognizes the fact that it is a very difficult life, that it's not meant for everybody, and that there are going to be times that are really challenging. And as I was researching this, you know, in the time of COVID, this really spoke to me in that they recognized that being in isolation can be very difficult. They recognize that having the same routine every day can be very difficult, that getting up at certain times can be very difficult. All of these things spoke to the fact that they recognized that people are going to fail sometimes. And so some of the ways that they dealt with that could be pretty harsh punishment, but a lot of the time they were suggesting that you should be compassionate towards people who are struggling. And you should allow them to have some time off from their work, perhaps, time with friends, maybe relax the rules a little bit, maybe make your actual monastery a little bit more chill so that people can actually reach their spiritual goals. And I thought that was really interesting because, at least for me, knowing that this is the pinnacle of religious life. So we we know that everybody was supposed to be Christian as, as much as possible. They're supposed to be devout. But monastic life is a challenging way of just serving God every day. It's interesting to see that there is flexibility in it. So there actually is built into the idea of a monastic life, the very fact that there are going to be times when you have to be flexible, when you have to acknowledge that on certain saints' days, people might drink too much. (laughs) You have to acknowledge that sometimes you need to take your novitiates out for a walk or sometimes people need to play as part of their religious practice. And so I don't know about you, but this is something that was a little bit surprising to me and a bit of a relief, I think, this recognition that people are going to do their best and sometimes they're going to fail, but we should be there for each other and help each other. So this is a a thing that kind of comes through as a theme for the book, hopefully. This compassion that we should be lending to each other is a very important part of living like a monk, and it's a very important part of wellness in general. So I did talk about this book with Peter Kineshny when it first came out in November, and so I'm revisiting this, and maybe some of the stuff that I'm saying today is not a surprise to you. Maybe you've read the book or you listen to that podcast and it's not a surprise to you, but this is a, a bit of a, a love letter to the people and scientists and monks and other authors that I've read that have helped me to live a life that is more meaningful, perhaps this made it a bit easier to get through COVID-19. All of these things I have learned and experienced in my life, I can see in the way that monks are living too. And it was such a joy to bring that together with the science that we see the people are working on all the time. And I really, in case there's any scientists listening to this or doctors, I really admire the work that they're doing and I love bringing it all together. So hopefully this book, if you haven't read it yet, is one that you like. And hopefully these little factoids that I've given you are are interesting to you. I hope that you'll join me on February 25th on my social media channels. So it's at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And I'm going to be talking live with Helen Castor, who's one of my absolute history heroes. I know I mentioned that already, but 
I'm a serious fangirl about her. <laughs> She's also really nice and has become an absolutely lovely friend. So if you just want to hang out with us for an hour, I'm going to be giving away some books and I'm going to be making an announcement about what is coming up next. So hopefully you'll join us February 25th at one o'clock Eastern time for the late launch with a couple of historical ladies who launch. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on this week, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, the big news this week is a study in the uh, journal Science looking at medieval manuscripts, and particularly the ones that were of literary stories, like your chivalric stories, things like that, heroic tales. And they wanted to figure out how many were lost over the time. How many have survived, how many were lost. And what they did was they looked at ecology, and kind of a, a way of researching how many animals have gone extinct by kind of looking at what has survived. So through this, they figured in medieval Europe, about 90% of all medieval manuscripts that dealt with like stories and literary stuff are gone. They no longer exist, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and with that, maybe about like one third of all the kind of literature has been lost. Wow. So really, really kind of fascinating stuff. Yeah, when you think about the fact that some of the most stories have survived in only one manuscript, it makes you think about all the things that didn't survive. There's got to be lots. 90%. Wow, that's a lot. Apparently, they, they figured that places like Iceland and Ireland had a better survival rate of these medieval stories because they were so insular. Mm -hmm. But like, say, stories in English, such as, you know, Gow and the Green Knight, those got a lot more easily lost. So that was kind of a fascinating work. A, a big international team of scholars worked on it. So the, yeah, so that just uh, came out like on the news yesterday. And it should be one of the probably most important news pieces of the, of the year, I think. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, so we've got that on the site. We have Matthew Terrio taking a look at the game uh, Crusader Kings 3 for all our video game fans. And uh, we will also be doing a piece on the word crusade and when and where it exactly first appeared. Wow, that's a tricky one too. There's a lot of tricky scholarship this week on the website. But more importantly, this week, you've got something on the go. Yes, my book launch, which is slightly late, but that's okay. A late launch is fashionable, right? <laughs> Hopefully, a lot of people will come on to have read the book. Yeah. Uh, and we'll have questions and you know, maybe a few words of praise, hopefully not too much criticism. <laughs> wow, Peter, thanks. Yeah, a friend of mine was talking about this as being kind of like a concert tour, right? Everybody's already got the album, so they're ready to sing along when they get there. So hopefully it'll be a good time for everyone. We'll have some giveaways, and I will be making a mysterious special announcement at the end. Ooh, mysterious. I know. <laughs> it's going to be good. I'll try to do my best on Medievalist to let people know. And, Thank you. Uh, everyone who's kind of listening to this podcast, make sure you stop on Friday and stop what you're doing and uh, go online. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you to everyone who supports the Medieval Podcast and Medievalist.net's other work on Patreon. In addition to ad-free options for this podcast and for the website, there's plenty of other amazing stuff for patrons like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, a book club, and maps for patrons only by Tina Ross. To find out how to lend your support, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from monks to mead, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sobolski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening and have yourself an awesome day.